you know, when you get on age, it's, you, you realise at a time when I was lying on the bottom at Lizard Island holding a magnifying glass, looking at recruit fishers, that it was time to move on to something I could see. <laughs> so that's what I've done here. I'm working on the world's largest fish, which is the whale shark. It's my privilege to work on these animals. They're iconic. They're really a symbol of Western Australia. But in actual fact, they occur right around Australia, in many tropical countries around the world. I have the privilege of working with some very smart people, Lee Fuman, Randy Davis, I'd like to acknowledge, both at one at the University of Texas, the other at Texas A&M. Um, OK, I think I just turned it off. <laughs> How are we going? That one. OK. It's an interesting paradox that we have these very, very large animals, some of the biggest animals that have ever lived on Earth. And yet, funnily enough, they eat the smallest of prey. Take whales, for example, eating krill. Um, basking sharks, uh, a distant relative of whale sharks, eating copepods. Or whale sharks themselves eating these tropical krill, which are no larger than your fingernail. Now, how do they get on with that? Well, it, it, it basically remains a problem for whale sharks. They live in warm, nutrient-poor waters. That means they have to get a lot of those krill in to survive. Moreover, that warm water means that their metabolic rates run very, very fast. So that, that means they have to feed that metabolic rate. They need lots of food. Now, if you swim along like this with your mouth open doing what's called ram filtration, it's energetically expensive. Anyone who's thrown a bucket over the side of a moving boat knows just how much it, how effort it takes to pull that thing back on board. Well, whale sharks have developed one strategy for that, and that's gulping of prey. Here you see a whale shark, and you can see some krill arriving at the surface suspiciously. That's because this whale shark's actually in an aquarium. He's in... <laughs> there are five of them. They're five metres long. The aquarium's the size of a football field. It's in Okinawa, and uh, in that same aquarium there are schools of man you know, manta rays, there are schools of tuna. It's quite amazing. But what it means for those sharks when they're doing this sort of foraging, this sort of ram filtration, is that they must be strong selection for cost-efficient foraging. They're going to have to do this in warm water, in nutrient-poor oceans, very, very efficiently. So how do we get at that? How do we, how do we actually find out what a whale shark's doing when it's at Ningaloo? Well, it's a bloody difficult question, really. The problem is these whale sharks, they're on the surface for about 20 minutes. The rest of their time down at Ningaloo, they're spending it at about 60 to 30 metres, well beyond diveable depths, well beyond the depth where we can easily observe them. So what we need are some eyes on this. And fortunately, a bunch of people like Lee and Randy, who I work with, very smart blokes, came up with some fantastic bits of gear. This is a, uh, this is a, a tag here. It sits in a yellow, buoyant float. Now, that tag just doesn't record the position of the animal. It actually also records video, audio, the 3D position of the animals that swims through the water, temperature, light intensity, dissolve. It's a mini lab, basically. So we don't just get where the whale shark's going, we get the context, the oceanographic context around that shark. And we get to see what it sees. So it's a pretty special sort of uh, instrument. So what do you do with it? We put it on a shark. We attach it to the backs of sharks. And we then let those, where we go with this? OK. There's one attached to the back of the shark. And we then let the shark swim around. Now, on that tether, there's a burn wire down here. It basically burns through after a pre-programmed, or after a period of time, um, usually about 24 hours. This tag pops off, comes up to the surface. The aerials, there's a, a satellite tag on it that puts us in the, lets us know where the, where the thing is floating and then a radio tag on the VHF transmitter that allows us to basically track it down. We can get the, we can get the instrument here, download it, and see what the animal's been doing. OK, here's some vision of what the animal's actually doing at 60 metres at Ningaloo. I, I apologise for the black and white. We'll go National Geographic with colour very shortly, but um, this is where we're at at the moment. Now, there's some really interesting things here. This animal is gliding. I think a video stopped just there. And this animal is swimming. Can we run that uh, gliding video again? Anyway, you can see in this one that the instrument is moving back and forth, back and forth, in time 
with the, uh, with the tail beats of the whale shark. Whereas on, when the animal's just gliding, the instrument doesn't move at all. Looks like we've got a <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, you get, it's actually pretty much what it looks like anyway, really. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we did, uh, this is data from a couple of years ago. We've repeated this study a number of times now. But um, we tagged a couple of male sharks. In fact, most of the sharks at Ningaloo are male. They're usually around somewhere between the three to about eight metre mark. They're actually still juveniles at that stage. Where the adults are, um, in particular adult females, we don't really have a lot of ideas, but the, the aggregations we're getting at Ningaloo are these lots of these juvenile males. So we tagged a couple. We put this instrument out on a couple of these males. We did it off Point Cloats, which is about halfway up the reef um, between Coral Bay and uh, Tantabiti. And the yellow and red tracks here are the tracks that those whale sharks follow over a period of about 24 hours. Now what we've done here is I've taken a couple of little cut squares out of the, out of the track and I've re-displayed re them here. So now we've got this sort of a 3D look at them. We've got depth down here and here we've got distance. Now, what the video has allowed me to do, or the accelerometer in that, in that tag has allowed me to do, is it's allowed me to colour code where each one of the tail beats of that animal is happening. Now take a look at that. All the colours are on the upward path. So basically, the animal's gliding down these long, slow glides, and then beating very fast up back to the surface. Turns out, that gliding pattern is a typical pattern for many, many animals that both inhabit the oceans and the air. Take a look at the next um, pigeon that flies across in front of you when it's doing long distance flight. You'll see exactly the same thing. It'll glide down and then flap, 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 flap. Glide down, flap, 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 flap. Birds do it, pinnipeds do it, whales do it, and it turns out whale sharks do it too. The other, so, so that's one thing, it's, it's getting around its energy problems by using gliding, as one means. Another thing it's doing is it's moving incredibly slowly. These sharks swim at just really, really slow speeds. In fact, you would think that they would just about sink. However, they have a, a large liver full of oil, so they're, they're just slightly uh, negatively buoyant. <coughs> but they are capable of the occasional burst of speed when they, when they feel like um, so the energy savings in this. We did a few little back of the envelope, well, a little bit more than that, but calculations as to work out how much energy do these things actually save by using these sorts of tactics. Well, they save anywhere between 11 to 18% of their energy doing this glide, swim, swim, glide, swim, swim, as opposed to horizontal swimming. Their dives are also asymmetric. That means they basically go down in a gentle, gentle slope and come up very steeply. They spend a lot less time in the energetically intensive phase of the dive than they do in the part which they get for free. And if they hold their mouths open while they're diving, they get filtering for free as well. So the constant slow swimming speed is another, is another issue for them. They're really very good at swimming slowly. And relative to swimming in a horizontal direction with their mouths open, they save around roughly 25, somewhere in the order of 25% of their energy costs. So cost-effective foraging, they certainly are. They've been around for a million years, so I guess, you know, a, a few million years, so I guess uh, they've got plenty of time to uh, become very efficient at doing some of the tasks they face every day. Um, one of the other cool things we get out of the video is some really in interesting insights into natural history. Here's our shark swimming along with its attendant school. Oh, come on. <laughs> or not. Okay, check out the bait fish at the top. I'm going to stop pointing the video, that's clearly what's causing it. Let's see if he's up for it. Is that boy there? It ran before.
Okay, let's see, imagine. Now one of the theories was that uh, these bait fish hung around these large sharks for protection. Let's see if that's true. <laughs> <laughs>